All right, so welcome everybody, and uh, we are back for another another time together with uh, Radio Free NAD. And uh, I thought what we would do today is work with the uh, kind of get a recap, uh, maybe a very minimal recap, but a recap a little bit of some of the stuff that happened at annual council uh, that concluded this week, and uh, also. Uh, one of the questions I think we we might look at with some profit, and I want to set the parameters for it. Um, but I was thinking if we were uh, if we could travel back in time, uh, three years or more, to the way things were, you know, in the early months of 2020, uh, and we go back and look at in our local churches how how we did things at that time and, and there may not be a time exactly like that in the future i'm not predicting that uh although it wouldn't particularly surprise me but what mistakes did we make in our local church and um what should we potentially do different how would we carry forward the work in our local congregations and um and do it more effectively uh, what principles would we would we stay with? What principles might we might we modify compared to what we did? I'm not trying to get over into um, in this particular occasion. I'm not trying to get over into um, the church's stand on vaccination or anything like that. What I'm talking about is at the local church level, and probably we all had some struggles and interesting pieces at the local church level trying to figure out what to do and different opinions. So. Um, but I don't think we've spent, I don't know of any time that really we've spent um, in this three years since that, then really going back and and being uh, careful and trying to look again at what we did and how we might do it differently and be more effective. So that's one thing I'd like to maybe spend some time with today is to look at that question, what, where did we go wrong and where could we go better in a future crisis what what needs what needs do we um what needs do we have um that uh that we need to be happy ready and in place uh for the next crisis uh which could be could be a few weeks away it could be many months away it could be years away the next civilization rattling crisis which i think we had three years ago but anyway, let's go back to uh, annual council. I don't know how familiar you all are with annual council, um, but uh, we had every every fall you have a meeting of annual council. The church meets. It's one of the major. It's the major meeting of the year, really, uh, in between GDC sessions. And what was quite interesting was that in the last few days of the council this year, uh, a motion came up to uh, a motion came up to take away the new wording that found its way into the church manual at the last GC session that has been, in my opinion, has been uh, quite uh, immediately, like immediately, said before the ink was even dry, it was being abused to block speakers, uh, particularly in uh, examples in Potomac Conference. And um, there's other examples too. But that wording has been uh, suggested now that, uh, that that wording would be actually, much of that wording would be stripped out of the church manual, but that would have to wait till the next GC session. So anyway, I thought that was a very interesting development at annual council. Uh, here's some wording that got put in and boom, now they're ready to strip it back out. Uh, and because I think that the people have seen the potential for its misuse and maybe its actual misuse. So um, to me, that was kind of the, the major, uh, there's two major things from this annual council in, in my mind. That's one of them. And the other one is uh, looking for strong action in, in regard to the German uh, developments in the German subsection of, of the church with uh, the pro-LGBTQ people there. Um, I was looking at annual council with hope. I'm not sure how much expectation, but certainly with some hope that possibly some extremely strong action would uh, would start happening there to address that issue. And um, I can't say that I think that happened. Um, so anyway, I'm interested in anybody else chipping in. I think you all have your mics marked off and I'm looking at a bunch of gray blobs here on the screen. So I've got the only pretty face here on the screen. 
but uh, if any of you want to show yourself or just talk, uh, open your mic and uh, any thoughts you have about the annual council, um, this would be the time for that. Uh, just kind of looking. We want to be encouraged at annual council, but we don't want to be unrealistic. Um, did the church miss some opportunities or what are you seeing some positive things? There were some other things that happened too that weren't necessarily all bad, but those were the two, the two takeaways I have. Good on the church manual change, maybe changing that again, and uh, not so good in terms of uh, action on the German LGBTQ section. I uh, didn't see the strong action there that I would have liked to see, uh, at least even to see it kind of start something coming. But I'm really from Missouri these days, you know, just want to speak to uh, your expectations, um, your anything from an annual council, either of those two points I brought up, do you think those are, are meaningful points or, or not so much? Linda? Um, I, I think the, uh, the church manual thing is a very positive thing. I was very excited to see that, that they actually did something, <laughs> which sometimes it seems like we just spin our wheels. So um, that was really good. And they are going to change, from what I understand, the other little area in the church manual. Or no, um, there was a that other little sentence. I think it was on a different page. Maybe you already spoke about that. Yeah, there's two, two spots that have the same, same as problem. Um, yeah, so okay. and I think that they're, I know they're trying to work on the wording for the second spot right now. Um, oh, good. Without telling you how I know that, I I know that. So, so anyway, yeah, this was quick, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised. I like to be pleasantly surprised <laughs> um, that um, they changed it so quickly. The thing that does concern me is uh, I don't know if you read the uh, what's still going on with Gaithersburg, but it's just like they keep going forward in that conference no matter knowing that they're wrong which is kind of sad um pastor larry was having kind of glitchy um connection before he got on the um the call so uh i'm sure he'll be on shortly about to sign in so my name isn't up there on the board but at any rate uh my understanding is that the only thing annual council is able to do is to this was referred back to GC in closed session since that was a full session action that changed the reading in the church manual uh, on the issue that uh, some conferences have been abusing. And so it is hopeful, but my best understanding is that it has to wait to go back to GC in closed session to get fixed. So if somebody knows differently, please let me know. I was just wondering if that gives them time to go ahead with their own agenda for the next two years. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> well, you know, uh, Potomac Conference is, is certainly on notice. I think they probably had a bad smell around them at annual council. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. But they haven't been too uh, worried about how people feel about it anyway, as far as I could tell. So maybe, maybe they will carry on, try to carry on their agenda. Larry. The ultimate fix for this has to wait for a GC in full session, right? Yeah, changes to the uh, church manual cannot happen until the GC session. So the church manual that we have, we're stuck with that wording basically until until then. That's why when I uh, did the video on it, I called for the for them not to change the wording, but for them to freeze implementation of it because that's something within their power but changing the wording they really can't do that between gc sessions so i kind of had a workaround for them but uh, i think it occurs to me that the actions that were taken that authorized originally authorized uh, women as elders were also only taken as an annual council action and have never been voted on really at the uh, world general conference level so isn't this change sort of in the same um, a state of limbo where the annual council has recommended it, but the uh, worldwide session has not endorsed it. 
Yeah, the uh, the woman elders is uh, never got addressed at the top uh, level, so it it is a uh, it creates a forest for us there. It's, it's an interesting it's an interesting piece. Now the current one, they're planning to bring that to the GC session for final, you know, up or down or adjustment. Whereas women elders, I don't think that's headed to the session at any time coming up. It'll, it'll come up now, when they think they can win the vote. We might see it, pardon me, we might see it at the annual council, I'm sorry, at the GC session level again. But uh, I hope that day doesn't come too soon. It just occurred to me that we're taking the stance that this uh, rescission of the uh, Turk Banjo language is not in effect yet because it hasn't been voted on by a world uh, session. But um, another approach would be to say annual council has taken the action. And so, uh, uh, you know, the annual council is certainly recommending this. Would we act, uh, act accordingly? Because people have certainly uh, acted accordingly with regard to the women elders issue. It's an excellent question. And the problem is that in the meantime, people go ahead and run with it. And then people start assuming that it's simply a blanket uh, permission to do. Uh, so I know some churches that have had women elders and never even voted it in uh church business session they just assume that's the way it was and they could do it i uh, never questioned it and then on the other hand in my own local church um larry this is ben Slavio, and i didn't get my name up there i'm sorry about that uh, anyway um we just recently last month had a vote on uh ordaining women elders and the first vote that the church held in business session was not to abide by the guidelines that annual council had set out if you're going to ordain women elders in your church. The guidelines call for a clear majority or a clear consensus. So the first thing they did was somebody went up and made a motion that uh, we simply go by GC rules of order, which is 50% uh, of the vote plus one. And that was voted. And then the motion to go ahead and uh, get permission to ordain women elders in the Canton Church passed by 54%, which is now then the policy of the Canton Church. 14 years ago, we had the same discussion. And because we followed the guidelines of the GC uh, Autumn Council that approved women elders, they needed 66% and they got 59%. So here for 14 years, we've been making some progress. More people understand the issue and vote against it. Nevertheless, this time it passes. And so now that's, that's the status quo. So Ben, I didn't get exactly what the, the it was the issue, the women's ordination as far as elders go at your church. This, as far as elders go, yes, it was only that issue. However, uh, uh, you may, of course, know that uh, the Rocky Mountain Conference at the last constituency meeting, uh, they voted to go ahead and allow for the ordination of women gospel ministers. And coming at this time, uh, in that atmosphere, it basically is the Campion Church uh, approving of the open rebellion by the conference to start ordaining women ministers and going off the back of that well if we can ordain women ministers we can certainly ordain women elders and so uh that was one of the arguments made um so yeah you know anytime that a conference goes into rebellion against what the gc has voted it opens up avenues for further and further and uh, the Campion Church has changed radically in the last few years because our membership has grown from approximately 300 to uh, approximately 850 in the 39 years I've been there. So um, uh, anyway, a lot of things have changed and it's becoming a more liberal church. And I, it's really unfortunate because in my opinion, and strictly my opinion, my best understanding of how the Lord works with us, because we remained a conservative church overall for all those years, the Lord blessed, 
and then we grew in numbers. And because now we have grown in numbers, many of the new members no longer desire us to be a conservative church. So I fear for the church going forward. It is it because the like the children of the conservative people have moved there? I mean, what has caused this? Well, I'll give you, I mean, some, some inside knowledge on that is simply uh, the Boulder Church went so liberal in the last few years, that's where the one project was based and so forth, that the conservative members of the Boulder Church couldn't take it anymore, and they transferred their memberships, and a large percentage of them, I think we got about 40 members at that time, came to the Campion Church, even though it's a far drive for those people that live in Boulder, uh, or at least further for almost all of them, and they had their memberships there. But then what happened that was interesting, uh, the next wave of people that came from the Boulder Church were the older people in the Boulder Church whose friends had left. And they didn't really fit in the new Boulder Church. And so they followed their friends. It's scary. <laughs> and they voted. And then, of course, we have lots of new members that have transferred Thank in. has a fairly good uh, record of baptizing people, but uh, most of our members come because we have the academy here and so forth. And so there was a constant change uh, with that employment. And now we have Voice of Prophecy, which is a large employer. Uh, although I think that most of the people that are employed at Voice of Prophecy are conservative by nature. Um. I'd like to interject here. I see I'm the host and Larry is still not back. So um, he might take this a different direction when he comes back. But um, we're talking a little bit about church culture and um, what it used to be and what it is. And um, I always like to think about conversations like this in the frame and in the context of Jesus and the disciples, because um, Jesus really entered the scene on um, a very pivotal pivotal time um, where there was a lot of flux in the church and um, in the political and religious um, intersection. And so I, I think a relevant um, question to ask ourselves is, um, number one, how can we be relevant to our church right now? And how can we be relevant to the external body of whom we're to minister? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Years ago, Natalie, uh, I uh, taught at Campion for three and a half years. And there was a constant... Larry, the guy from Michigan, Zoom meeting. But at any rate, um, many years ago when I taught at Campion, there was a push by a certain number of the staff continually were trying to change things like for example get rid of the dress code um, and, and, and parents were pushing for that to some extent and, and my continual response was that people didn't pay the amount of money which was large back then but it's small in comparison to today's uh, uh, tuition costs they didn't pay that extra tuition because they wanted us to be more like the public schools and so any move we made in that direction that wasn't based on actual principle that was biblically sourced uh, was, was, was going to kick back against us. And I think that proved out in the long run. As tuition got more and more expensive, uh, people got less and less interested in sending their children to an Adventist school that wasn't holding the standards that they uh, had hoped that they were sending their kids to. So I think the same thing is true of the church. Okay. Um I'd like to maybe suggest that what made Jesus and his disciples relevant is um, their connection with the Heavenly Father, their devotional life, and then um, the understanding that they had to carry out in their personal circles and then extended circles what they were receiving in their devotional life. And I, um, as we look at what's going on um, within our church. And there have been many who have been sounding the alarm for years. And, you know, unfortunately, what we're reaping now is a situation of decades. And so um, our, I 
for myself, I've just been asking myself a lot lately and my close friends, what can we do now about this? And um, I guess that would be the point. Um, I guess that's the point at, you know, where we need to talk about what we can, what we can be doing now um, on a daily basis for ourselves and what we can be doing to build up the church. Because um, the church, it's true, is our structure and our, um, our infrastructure, as it were. But also the church is um, the people uh, that exist. Um, as living stones and the people that are on the outside looking in. So um, I think that is a very relevant question as we um, look to see what's happening in the future because global changes are so quick, they're so complex, and pretty soon all of us could wake up to something new tomorrow or the next day, and then what would we do? And um, how would we carry out the Lord's mission in our personal and church circles and going forward? I guess that's what I find a very compelling question. So restate that question again. So given all the changes that are happening in our church, our church doesn't look conservative anymore. Um, and given the changes that are happening in the world, the world looks incredibly unstable. What can we do to build up our church now and to carry out um, the mission that God gave us to carry out? So, yeah, so let's let's work on that a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm also especially interested in, in the local level on this, because some of the things that are at other levels are at least initially outside of our scope of you know big opportunity to change but in terms of in terms of your your local congregation that you where you worship what what um applying trying to apply that question there how can we make sure that the community views this as truly you know bible people that are looking for bible answers and have bible answers and we're not we're not liberal but we are uh, searching for go, God's right answers. I don't know if we can go in that direction. Um, I'd like to just talk about something really quickly. Um, I've been traveling in the past week, and um, I had a problem with my phone, so I stopped in at the Verizon store. And um, I was talking to the lady, and she had on nose rings and tattoos, and, you know, she was just totally tatted out and um, worked up and um, she said, oh, what brings you to this part of the country? And I said, oh, you know, blah, blah. Anyway, I um, started talking with her and I just said, you know, I'm really concerned about what's going on. I think this is the end times. I really would like to have a living connection with Jesus Christ um, so that I can make sure um, that no matter what happens out in the world, that I am just stable. And, um, and so I gave her um, something like the great controversy, and she was very receptive to it. And I just thought, you know, we always make assumptions, but something that we can always do is just carry around literature and um, have it ready to go for community at all times and be willing to talk about anyone at any time. Um, because we know at the situation of Pentecost, um, 3,000, thousands of people were converted in a day because of little drops of seed the Lord had been um, sowing prior to Pentecost. And she received it. She was very excited about it. Yeah, neat example. Uh, I would say this, that uh, our target is the world because we don't know who is actually searching, who's looking for truth. But I'm afraid if we start um, liberalizing, becoming more liberal in our approach and how we do church and how we reach out, what we're going to do is we're going to cast a much wider net, but uh, uh, that net is not self-filtering. In other words, if people are looking for truth, when they find Bible truth, they stay with it. And my best personal example is my, my wife, my first wife died and when I remarried. Uh, my wife had been uh, a member of a very charismatic church in this area, Resurrection Fellowship, a 
very exciting church where they had the loud music. I mean, seriously, that was uh, something that was real hearing protection when I went to church. And she'd been slain in the spirit and all those things. And then uh, she had come into Adventism by the work of a literature evangelist. And when I met her, she was already an Adventist. And I asked her, why did you, how did you react to going from that to a, a conservative Adventist church? And she joined the most conservative church in our area, which is the downtown Loveland Church. And it, it in, in, in comparison, it was tremendously uh, boring, really. But she said, well, I just could tell this was truth and the other wasn't. So I stayed with truth. And I think we have to eventually win people that are looking for truth, not just win anybody that's attracted to us. We try to attract people. And we have to attract them with truth if we want to win truth that actually is going to make it to the gospel. You know, the people almost pre-select themselves because just to believe that there is such a thing as truth is is opposite the current line. The current line, you know, is that the reality is socially constructed. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. There is no ultimate truth. Have a nice day. You know, go make your own salad. I'll make my salad and uh, we'll all sort of manage. But when somebody is attracted to the truth and they believe there is a truth, um, that is kind of a pre-selection uh, that the Holy Spirit's kind of worked out for us. Because whenever people are searching for truth, uh, you will sort of expect that the Holy Spirit will lead them by the by the Adventist kind of pull them on a chain by the Adventist Church, clear, crisp, fresh, tasty Bible, actual Bible truth. Anybody else want to comment on this topic here before we go? Uh, maybe spend a little bit of time on the one I mentioned at, at the beginning. Um, what we might do better in a new crisis uh, locally in our local congregation. So I'll just jump in on the uh, the question of relevance. Um, you, most of you know that Ellen White talks about uh, the health message as the primary means by which prejudice would be removed from secular minds and you know natalie used the example of jesus and and that's what he was doing he knew that he needed people to see what he would do at the cross as the most important thing and his means of gathering the attention was mainly his healing that's what he did more than anything else and i've seen that in my experience my my aunt is an agnostic bookstore owner and uh, she wanted nothing to do with god or anything like that but she had a friend who was healed by some medical missionaries and that was the first time she actually asked us, like, is this what you guys are connected to? Um, um, also, recently, I was uh, I had the chance to visit my sister in the Caribbean. And, you know, I was kind of just offhanded. We were having a discussion about, you know, you. this is about a year and a half ago. We were talking about, like, a lot of the stuff with the UFOs. And um, I was telling her, and I was like, yeah, you know, the Bible kind of alludes to some of that stuff and and ellen white she also talks about it so i'm like you're gonna see a lot more of it um as it unfolds and you know she just kind of was listening i was just kind of like okay and then a few months ago about two three months ago she was reaching out she's like namiko like what is going on like all of this disclosure happening like it's exactly like what you described and i said yeah this is prophecy fulfilling this is you know the bible is basically unfolding before your eyes and she, she was like like nervous and so and she's she's young she's like she works for um i think uber eats and she's like 24 25 this is a sister that i wasn't raised with though um so you know it's kind of a reconnection despite us being separate for a long time but it's almost like she basically is a person who was raised around a secular community a little bit of adventist influence from my father but she was just like this is like what you talked about is actually happening right now. So this is interesting to me. So she's like, give me some Bible promises. So we started, you know, sharing some Bible texts and stuff like that. And so she started kind of, kind of turning back towards God. And this is a young person. Um, so I think, I think the main thing that I'll say is just play to your strengths. You know, uh, there's a lot of different areas. Like some people can work with health. Uh, you know, I was just sharing up in Edmonton. Uh, I was speaking at a church and, you know, just sharing how, uh, there was a place called Hutchinson Adventist Seminary during the, the 1918 flu pandemic where they had 120 people and about 60 or 70% of them contracted the flu. Nobody died. 
And so that the general public, the, the death rate was about 10 to 20 percent, whereas within Adventist institution, it was pretty much zero percent. And this has also happened at uh, Canadian, the, um, the college in Oshawa as well. Yeah, we could hear you just fine. I okay. think Larry, I think Larry was just uh, having difficulty. OK, well, anyway, I don't want to take up all the time, so I just wanted to share, uh, say, you know, every different church communities have different strengths. So try to I figure kind of like Moses, you know, when God asks him what's in his hand, maybe we should each ask what what strengths do we have that we can use right away to uh, to connect with people and to to show ourselves relevant. Yeah. Amen. It's interesting, this uh, thing we had three years ago and how we know that the health the health angle is going to be a primary the perhaps the primary angle uh, so in so many ways in these last days and then what do we get we get a crisis that's uh, that's in that in that category well at least part of it, the crisis is in that category so can't can't get ahead of god he's always ahead of the game Okay, well, this is very good. Um, do you want to take some time or not with this question about uh, uh, what could we do better in our local congregations if we find ourselves in a crisis uh, similar to the one we faced uh, three years ago? And again, I'm talking about locally as kind of an area of, what, of practical focus. Um, and we probably each have a different story about what happened in our local local setting. So, uh, yeah, anybody want to speak to that? What have we learned anything at all? Is there, is there anything we would, would you, if you could replay the thing, would you do it exactly the way you did it back then? Um, how would you face maybe a different crisis, a similar but different crisis? What were, what were the gaps? What were the, uh, what were the weak spots in your, in, in, in what happened for you in your local congregation? Uh, our congregation pretty much didn't do, I mean, we offered masks to people, but we really did not do what the authorities, I suppose, would say we should. Uh, personally, I think I would not fold as much at the beginning. <laughs> Just stand up to it. Let the chips fall where they may. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> well, not everybody has the luxury of worshiping in a church. Is actually on the line, straddling two states, half of the buildings in each each in two different states. <laughs> which I think played in your advantage. Yeah. Um, I think if we're going to be prepared for then, then we need to be doing. Um, what we're going to be doing now every single day right now and um, of course I'm going to talk about the literature because that's the simplest thing but that's something people can do by themselves or you can pair up with somebody at church or you can pray for someone in fact I I always think that coupling up and being protective of each other by um, these actions right now is a very good way to go by um, doing something with a prayer partner now, passing out literature now, um, reaching out in some way now, and maybe we should make it a goal that as a group, by the next time we meet, everybody gives out X amount of literature or um, something like this, something actionable to get the ball rolling. And maybe it doesn't need to be that, or somebody prays with, a stranger or do something to just get out of the comfort zone and start taking action now. Yeah, Are I keep a staff. Yeah, go ahead. Were you asking about what we should do for outreach if we have a similar situation in the future or what we should do to educate and strengthen our con congregation? Uh, I guess both. Um, like when your church was making decisions about what to do, you, you might have had um, in, you might have had guidance from the state. You might have had guidance from your conference. Uh, and then you had your local opinions, whatever they were. And it's kind of hard probably to to take from three years ago in that case and specifically apply it to some future case that we don't know the details of. But um, like I know a church, for example, in the state of Washington that heard uh, about the 
morning about this virus being transmitted on printed matter. And this particular church actually took all of it. It had a, a substantial outreach, literature outreach um, part of its ministry. It took it all and packed it away in boxes so that because people might have picked up a germ off of it. And they utterly stopped literature distribution uh, at that time because there was word of worry about, you know, uh, money, things being transmitted on paper. And so they put away all their literature. And so that might be something. With it. Would they do that again? I hope not. But that's that was the course of action they took. Maybe that was a miss. <laughs> but um, some things we did that uh, how our local church made its decisions, but also personally, because I think what, what Natalie just shared, um, literature is kind of like the first thing that, you know, like I said, it's an easy go to. I mean, it makes you uncomfortable, maybe, unless you're used to giving it out. But um, yeah, I mean, I keep. I keep a stack of glow tracks and uh, other literature, and I, whenever I, I feel naked, I feel like it's more important to be wearing uh, wearing glow tracks and literature. It's more important, more important to have that in your pocket than just to have an underwear on. When you go out in the public, it's more important to have some kind of literature than any other thing. Yeah, wear pants, but or you know whatever. But but you should go out with uh, <laughs> you should you should be ready and watch for opportunities. Because we're only coming this way this way one time, you know. I mean, someday you'll mm -hmm. be. Yeah, you got to give it out while you can. Our community, the people that, that we know within the church as church members, that we believe in God's treatments and we believe in the new system that He gave us, and we would have handled it very, very differently than we did this time. I think it would be easier the next time, though, if the government starts imposing mandates again. I think it would be easier. More people are open now to that message. Yes, we can improve our new systems because God gave them to A lot of people in the congregation don't really understand what it means to think for yourself. So whatever the conference feeds them, they just eat that up. So I found that in my congregation, it was always helpful to send videos to people of of uh, you know groups like this or a YouTube video that would really explain to them what the truth is about what's taking place so that they weren't fearful and so they were able to critically think about what they're hearing and process it and then continue to do the things that they need to do like my congregation most of us were on the same page about what needed to what needed to get done how we were going to act how we were going to still continue to reach out to people so the ones that were not, we tried to send them videos. We tried to have meetings at church to expose lies. And then for the ones that were strong already in the truth, I'm talking about the truth about the propaganda that was spread and also the truth about, you know, what we believe and how we need to go about situations like this and religious liberty. We just continue to talk and strengthen each other. So I think knowledge is power and a lot of our people don't have it so you really have to do whatever you can to spoon feed it to them especially the ones that are receptive and there were some who were receptive so eve let me ask a follow-up question to that uh did you find that your congregation was divided between kind of like two groups of people i mean there's different ways you were divided between two groups of people but i'm thinking in terms of i found in my, my congregations that i had a number of people i have a lot of older people um, and we're thankful for every person of every age. But uh, I found that a lot of our older people, they don't get, they didn't even have cell phones. I mean, they don't even have email. Just, you can't even send them a video. Um, they get all of their news to this day, some of them from the mainstream news. Um, and I found that our congregations were kind of divided between two groups, a group of people who were kind of like way on old media and only kind of had usually had one more or less one opinion which was the opinion on the old media and we had another group of people who were more searching the internet and could bump into things uh different viewpoints even though the internet they tried to kind of isolate you down into one narrative but we had we had another group of people who um would hear different angles that weren't all preferred angles and they would think for themselves more did you find your your people to be separated into those two groups kind of the permanent old media 
and then the group that is more has more options for hearing something different. Yes, we have we have those kinds of people as well because we have some elderly, we have some older, and we have like the younger group is comfortable with the computer. But what some of us did was we just printed material out for the people that would never watch a video. We just print, and we have a small congregation. So if you have 800 people, it might be a little harder. But we printed stuff out and gave it to people. And I think one of the most important thing we did is during that time when we weren't allowed to meet at church, well, we were, our conference never made us, well, we had regulations, but what we did was because it was, the weather was nice. We had potluck every single day outside our church. And at that time, we were able to spread a lot of information and help people to try to understand. So meetings, and talking to people as a group, I think that went further than just sending them a video. Just being willing to sit there after church with a sandwich and just say, hey, did you hear this? Check this out. Look, I have this. I printed this out for you. Did you know this? And just educating them that way. Now, I will say that the ones who are very old-fashioned in their th thinking and really stuck in their ways, there's really nothing you could say to help them. So there's that group is, you know, you just do the best you can. You're nice to them and they come and they participate and some of them are naysayers. But overall, the group that was most active, we were all on the same page. And so we continued to, to do the things that we wanted to do and needed to do. Okay, excellent. Someone else, your experience, something you would do different this time or something you got right, something you feel like you're, you're congregation got right. I'll just throw in a quick comment myself here, and uh, maybe we need to be thinking towards wrapping up. But um, a lot of the leadership in, um, I'm thinking in one of my churches in particular, it was on the um, more golden years side, a little bit older. And a lot of those, some of those people were some of the people in that section that kind of had uh, the one narrative only. And we found that um, in that particular congregation, that there was uh, quite a quite a dilemma there between uh, an older group of members who were dominant in church, the leadership who were making decisions, and, and a younger group, which the younger group was a lot more gung ho, like yeah, well let's let's keep meeting, and uh, let's not close the church. And some of the some of the more aged group. Um, were a lot more tentative, a lot more ready to, you know, jump through the hoops they were told to jump through. Um, in our state, we had a particularly aggressive governor sending out executive orders, all uh, many of them a week sometimes. Um, and we had a lot of people, we had some people who were really, we had a really uh, challenging uh, thing to figure out how to go forward as a group because we were really, uh, had very different approaches um, because our, our leadership group was older and they were more stuck to the one narrative media. So just a piece of our experience uh, in one of my churches. Don't you think Pastor Larry, it has a lot to do with the older group believes the definition of a vaccine is what, like I had an elderly man turn around in church and say to my husband and I, and we weren't even talking about vaccines, well, you got the polio vaccine, didn't you? Like we we hadn't even said whether or not we had the vaccine, but I'm just saying they assume that what they're being told is the truth because they have this history of the vaccines and you know, things aren't always, I mean, pretty dishonest in the world we live in today. So, yeah. Yeah, well, when you got the polio vaccine, when I got the polio vaccine, I don't think there was any extra DNA in it. No. <laughs> no. But anyway. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I, think, I think we need to recognize that this is going to happen again. It's a 100% certainty. And so we have to, I think it's, I think it's important that we have calls like this and make plans and have some coordination in advance because it will it will happen again um we know that i think that we need to because of that we need to take 
continued steps. I know that it's it's unsavory. People don't want to do it. People think it's a waste of time, but I think we need to take some steps now to continue to educate our church members about the negative effects of these shots. And, uh, you know, there was a big hue and cry over the religious liberty issue, the liberty of conscience issue. But the fact is, is that there is a lot of evidence that people are not aware of. There's an informational vacuum that, that exists today because the mainstream media is not covering the damage to the shots. And people are getting their information from the mainstream media. There's an enormous amount of evidence that they are killing people. And I think that while we have the time to do so and the liberty to do so, it would be, it would be beneficial to spread that information so that people are more prepared because when it happens again and there's another lockdown, they will be back to getting okay. better from CNN or whatever. Um, I think that we need to be able to uh, be, be prepared to transition to home churches quicker. Uh, what happened last time is that churches were shut down and it broke the chain of connection between people. People stopped worshiping together. And, um, and so I think that we need some sort of plan in place to, to have a mechanism to continue to meet together. Um, whether that's small groups who have lines of communication open and can take coordinated action or what have you. I agree about the literature. I think that's excellent. And uh, um, I think that it would be good to have some thumb drives on hand because we are going to lose the internet. Um, so you have a stockpile of thumb drives because that's the sort of like the modern equivalent of the Walden Seas. Uh, you can hand out a pamphlet, but people watch videos. They don't read so much anymore. And and so you can you can pass out the videos that you want to have passed out. And um, and I, you know, to be honest with you, I think we should be doing this now because Dr. McCullough is giving excellent presentations. There's all of this evidence, and we need to put that evidence into people's hands so that they understand that they've been born. They understand that they've been doing. Sorry, that's my dog. That's it. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I wonder if anybody has even started to. Uh, what would be what would be maybe uh, need is if you had a pre. Uh, and wouldn't take a lot to do it. Have a resource that has all these videos downloaded and uh, have a little accompanying document like numbered one to 10 or whatever and say, look, uh, here, if you want to come up to speed, here's 10 quick things you can you can watch to kind of tune up on this. Start by, start. number one is this one. Number two would be watch this one. Number three would be watch this thing. I wonder if somebody has... Uh, put together something like that that could be you know downloaded onto a thumb drive and that might be a very handy piece to have we also ought to have a thumb drive uh the same the same kind of a deal but it should have steps to christ very controversy the bible um stuff like that on there so that again it's available for distribution um in another case like this I think that's a good idea. Maybe we could t start, um, maybe we could make a plan that um, by the time we meet again, we will have done X, Y, and Z. Um, and if if one person, if everybody does one thing, um, then that's fine. And if you do more than one thing, that's great. But the way to build up the church is to um, is to recruit people. So that's what we should be doing. And um, and so if we have an action, we, if we if we have a plan and an accountability before the next time we meet, then we have something to report um, so we could have that in the area of literature dis distribution and in the area of networking on a local level. Yeah, just to add to what Natalie said, I know somebody who has enormous bank of information because this stuff disappears from the internet and it's very, very hard to find with conventional search engines. And so you need to have the links handy at the very least. If you have the materials downloaded on a thumb drive, that's much better. Uh, but 
I know somebody, and then and then there are articles. There were articles written during COVID, which were posted on Fulcrum Seven or Advent Messenger or some other source, where where there was links, and those videos, those links are easy to cut and paste into an email, so that people can be brought up to speed and they can be they can be updated and um, and. And and that stockpile can be handy. I think it would be useful to have a centralized email, something that is probably web based and encrypted, so that uh, you know people can log in. It, you can you can even have a centralized email, for example, where you don't send an email. For example, you you create an email address, and you put the information into a draft. And so, so, for example, if you have all of the links, you put all of the links in a draft email and it's accessible to everybody who has the password to the email address. And you never actually have to send the email. So anyways, these are just ideas, um, but Larry, I can send you uh, like a huge uh, uh, document dump if you want from, from this person I know of who has, who has been just saving stuff over the course of the last three years. You know, uh, what I'd like to see, because I, my, what I'd like to see is if uh, one or two people here could make a subcommittee, so to speak, and um, meet together and coordinate and um, figure out and like maybe have, you know, a, a set, you know, the top 10 Spirit of Prophecy books I want to put on a thumb drive and gather that all up so that we actually had it in one spot same with the uh a a good just the top 10 and then you could always have a link to additional you could have other stuff in another in another folder uh if you want to go further you know here's another five hundred thousand documents but we, if we had kind of like a starting place i'm thinking of having kind of a current starting place both for for literature Kind of a thumb drives that are that are carrying inspired literature, and thumb drive that's carrying like was suggested here, um, current uh, current up to date information that could bring people up to speed, uh, and some of these other things. Because like you say, right now we have an opportunity. There's some degree of liberty. Um, how long this will last, uh, I, you and I don't know. But I agree with you. Uh, I believe I believe the days and the hours are numbered. Uh, we are these freedoms are going to you know maybe Twitter will X what's now called X app you know maybe that will go on for a while but I think they're going to take that back away from uh, and and it'll be under full blown uh, government control just as it sort of was before I, I think that these things are likely and that the clock is so to speak is ticking so it'd be good to have and then I think the third one was already mentioned. Uh, physical literature that you can actually hand out actual you know actual literature um, we should we should have that and we should get used to handing it out now what we can and uh, and be ready for the next crisis that we we actually yeah we have we don't have to wait like if there's a supply chain thing and you can't get stuff printed or you have to wait for something oh no it can't be mailed because there might be a germ on it you know to have some of that stuff now and be ready to distribute it and, and be get into the habit of distributing it and inviting people to study with you and so on. So Pastor Larry, um, the the committee, the subcommittee, what uh, could you summarize again what you would like to have see them do? I'd like to see us connected here just because you're the ones that connected here. Uh, I'd like to see two or three of you team up to create a data cache of, uh, you know, Spirit of Prophecy books on PDF um, or whatever format. Uh, I'd like to see a group of you here, two or three of you get together. And it sounds like J, uh, like JC here has um, uh, has access to a, a, a pretty large resource and go through and, and figure out how if you had to, if you if you had an hour and a half and you were locked in a room with, with somebody and they were like open to this and you said, look, can I take can we just take an hour and let me bring you up to speed where we would be, you know, like as of today. Um, I wonder if we could go through and have have these documents named and numbered 
they could even have a number and then their name and we could have one two three four five six seven eight, ten, ten or fifteen or five documents or thirty documents whatever consume them in this order and you could go through and show people what you have there and bring them up to speed because a lot of people don't even probably know even i don't even i wouldn't claim and I, i'm fairly i'm trying to be fairly you know have my antenna up and be alert uh but but i'm not sure if i was up to up to date as i as i'd like to be in terms of the latest uh understanding of some of the things that are coming out of the events of three years ago i'd like to be more more up to date myself so i'll, I'll bet a lot of our members don't even approach being up to date so i'd like to see a group that addressed that uh, so there would be two things, and then I like the idea too that you were making of, of literature. Just if we had a rebirth in terms of uh, our people of, of giving out literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Those does does so everyone on the call have literature right now that they could give out? Would it be too much to say before next? I mean, this is the kingdom of heaven we're talking about. Could we each give like five people? literature i i think that's a low number maybe but could we give five pieces of literature and i would like to encourage everybody to do specifically the three angels messages um and i think that there is loving and wonderful stuff but specifically relevant for our time right now is the book the great controversy or anything that has the three angels messages in it Yeah, that sounds good. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. So probably in two weeks, we'll do this again. And uh, we probably need to bring it, wrap it up here. But is there anybody else who wants to share anything here before we finish off? Some encouragement, some warning, but uh, trying to keep, we're trying, I'm trying to keep this in a little bit of a positive line. And I think following up in this idea of digital evangelism, let's keep that in mind because what, that's one of the things we're really talking about here is um, not stopping actual physical literature, but we're talking about kind of getting getting our game right, getting our game up to speed in terms of digital uh, digital outreach. And was mentioned maybe some digital uh, intra congregational communication in some in some ways. I've got a constant contact thing I've subscribed to, and I haven't got it. I've got a mailing list set up. That we could use to distribute stuff but i don't have it hanging on a website anywhere right now so just haven't i'm right now we're also doing evangelism in, in in my state and so we're kind of caught up with many nights a week or taken up by evangelism so those are my excuses the dog ate my homework but anyway we got a lot to do and it's, it's time to do it so um i want to get this mailing list set up so that we can it be one way we can stay connected so uh, maybe I'll have it set up uh, by the time we meet in two weeks. So, all right, the Lord bless you all, each one. We don't need to wait for other people to have this conversation. We need to have it and we need to maybe act directly in many ways. Um, and that's one thing that I think maybe one other piece that might've been lacking when that last global crisis hit, uh, we were all kind of left kind of flat footed and we didn't particularly have a lot of boldness or know what to do. We were just kind of trying to figure out the lay of the land but we shouldn't be caught off guard in the future and i agree with the warning we had here i, I really think i really think this stuff uh, there's no question there will be another uh crisis of global proportion i don't think we're gonna have to wait very long for it to, to materialize easily could be before we even something could could take place very quickly so yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's time to, uh, to, it's time to come up, bring our game up higher because we are the church. After all, we need to be ready. We need to be on the ball. We need to be, we need to flow with the events and God will use that mightily. Father in heaven, bless your people scattered from one end of this globe to the other. You can hear a lot of us perhaps in North America, but Lord, we've been slow we've maybe been waiting for other people to, to help us gather up lessons but we're not waiting now lord we we look we look and, and know you can teach us you can speak to us through the priesthood of all believers lord we are in here we are connected we are who we are we just pray you'll bless us and give us insights and help us not to be caught flat-footed the next time help us lord to be uh, ready 
able and armed and uh, dangerous for your kingdom, for your truth, for Jesus. And that's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, each one.